sound? All right, there we go. Thank you for your patience. I know that the, the, the crazy end of this school year, I know some of our students, they have uh, some of their, their year-end banquets for some of their uh, sports activities. So they are. Thank you for coming here tonight and, and doing your presentations. And I understand that you guys have to go once you're done. We'll, we'll have to make that accommodation. Uh, welcome to the PLTW Engineering Design and Development Capstone Project presentations. Our Engineering Design and Development course is the capstone course in the Project Lead the Way High School Engineering Program. It's an open-ended engineering research course in which students work individually or in teams to design and develop an original solution to a well-defined and justified open-ended problem by applying an engineering design process. Students perform research to select, define, and justify a problem. After carefully designing, sorry, defining the design requirements and creating multiple solution approaches, the students select an approach, create, and test their solution prototype. While progressing through the engineering design process, students worked to hone their organizational, communication, and interpersonal skills their creative and problem-solving abilities, and their understanding of the overall design process. And tonight, the students will present and defend their original solution. So without further ado, we will get started. This is a very exciting night, and I am very excited to hear uh, your, guys, your guys' presentations. So whoever it is, who's coming up first? All right, without further ado, we'll begin. Hi everyone, welcome to our group. We're Red & Co. I'm Carly Poland. This is Danny Schmidlin, and this is Walker Edel. So here's our problem statement. It's pretty long, but we're gonna forget that. So, in many cars, we have issues with holding different size water bottles, like these. Reusable or non-reusable, either too small or too big. So our solution was to create a solution for this problem, so it wouldn't fall over and create issues for later on while driving. So here's some pictures. Here's in Walker's car and it really doesn't fit because he has square cup holders. This is my car, it doesn't fit at all and just falls where I drive. And this is where Danny's is and just doesn't fit at all. All right, so um, at the beginning of the project, we were told to um, get a few mentors for the uh, process. We were told to reach out to people who are in the field or people we know who are just very helpful about things. And um, so we reached out to a few great people. Um, we had Lisa Burson, Ms. Burson. She was our um, second year PLTW teacher. We had Mr. Fields and Ms. Pulliam, who were both our third year PLTW teachers. And they kind of all just helped us along the way throughout, you know, with input here and there. And then Ms. Hill was our teacher this year, and she helped thoroughly throughout. She was awesome. And we also reached out to Mr. Leach and Mr. Veligal, who um, we contacted a couple times throughout the year to ask about like their thoughts on the next direction we could go. Especially helped with like, um, especially helped with the planning process before we became like began designing the product. So I'm talking for all of the survey, so get used to my voice. And I've also lost it, so bear with me. But um, Ms. Burson actually recommended that we send out a survey only because we really needed to justify our problem. And so back in November, we sent out the survey to everyone at Shawnee um, with the help of some of the teachers in the media center. And so on November 4th, the survey was sent out for the teachers, and then on the 12th, it was sent out for the students and anyone else that we could really find um, to help with just completing it. Um, so we only collected data from students for one day because we had a deadline that day, um, and then the teachers was collected for a little bit over a week. Um, so our survey audience was teachers and students at Shawnee, um, just because our target audience was people that use cars, so we figured that the teachers, they're gonna drive cars and they have water bottles, and then the students, they might have like sports or something, or they'll be in the car, obviously, so they use cup holders for their cups. Um, so in total, we had 331 responses, which was pretty good. 
So our first survey question was what types of plugs you have in your car. And we asked this question because we use a heating element in our cup holder. Um, so we decided to, we originally wanted to do cooling and heating, but we had trouble doing cooling. So we just turned to heating because people drink coffee in their car, especially in the morning on their way to school or something. So with this, with these results, we found that most people have the circular car outlets, like the just the things that you plug into your car. Um, and then they also had USBs. And then some people had wall outlets, but we didn't really feel like there were enough responses to justify putting a wall plug. So we ended up going with a USB, um, just because with the circular wall outlets, you can buy one of those things that has the USBs on it. So that just seemed like the most logical one to choose. So then our other survey question was, do you use cup holders in your car for drinks? And it seems like a stupid question because everyone obviously used cup holders for drinks. So, yes. And then our next survey question was, do you use a reusable water bottle? And 87% of the people said yes, they do use a reusable water bottle. So this further justified our problem um, that this cup holder is going to solve. So this next question was a little bit complicated and we should have structured it way better. But the question was, if you answered yes to the previous question, which was, if you use a reusable water bottle, how many ounces is your most frequently used water bottle? So it's kind of hard to see from here, but we analyzed all of the responses, which was a lot of work, but we found that most people used 32 ounce to 24 ounce water bottles. So this is a 32 ounce, and then this one's also 32 ounce, and this one is, this one's 40. Oh, this one's 40 and then this one's 32. So then the next question was, does your cup holder fit reusable bottles like Hydro Flasks, Yetis, Swells, um, just any reusable water bottle, but these three brands were the most common that we researched. Um, so 57% of people said no, that their cup holder does not fit, and that it is too big, or the bottle is too big for the cup holder. And then we had 34% of people say, yes, it does fit. However, the other two responses were either I don't have, I don't use reusable water bottles or the bottle is too small. So the majority of people said that um, the bottle is too big for the cup holder. So we felt that this justified the problem because that was kind of what we originally wanted to solve because these weren't fitting in any of our cup holders. And then our next question was how interested would you be in a cup holder extension to fit a drink? And most people said that they would be interested, and we gauged anything above a five as being interested. So this also justified our problem. Um, I mean, it seems like a pretty simple question, just gauging interest. And then our last question was, do you have a cup holder that heats up or cools down? And we had an overwhelming amount of responses that said no, because, I mean, I've never really heard of a cup holder that heats up or cools down. So this is pretty state of the art. <laughs> And then our last question was, how interested would you be if an attachment was made to heat or cool drinks in car cup holders? And just like the, the two questions ago, this one was just to gauge interest, and we gauged anything above a five as being pretty interested, and most people responded above a five, so we felt that that was good. So I'm going to talk about prior patents. So there are not many prior patents from when we started researching this for an adjustable cup holder. There's been different ones for adjustable or heating. So this one right here is the adjustable one that you can place anywhere in the car, but ours is just inside the cup holders itself, which is different from there. This is also another clip that is slightly adjustable, but not that adjustable. This one right here is a heating element. They use a battery pack, kind of like a Peltier, which we use, but it not much research was out there. So this one is a heating element as well. You put it on top of it, which is kind of bulky and, and out of the way. This one does use a Peltier, which we base our design off of, but like we didn't use the same pattern because we can't. So here's our designs that already existed since this design has not existed yet. This is a baby bottle warmer, which we kind of based our heat element off of. This is an Ember cup, which is $100 at Target, which heats up your coffee or any hot drink inside. And this is the WeatherTech phone adjustable thing to hold your phone while driving. So we're going to go into brainstorming right now. This is mine. So we do two different designs for each person. 
Right here, this is the base idea. We didn't have the adjustable bottom in the final design, but here we see the channels that hold the sides, which we did use in the end. My other one was the adjustable sides, but we couldn't figure out how to do that with the time needed and what we had. All right, so moving on to my brainstorming, um, I came up with these two designs just like everybody else did, and my first design featured a adjustable top like for the actual bottle, but it was pushing in rather than like sliding out, which we didn't end up going with because it wasn't like logistically reasonable. And then for the bottom of my cup holder, I had what I liked to call the Russian doll design, where pretty much one layer slid into the next, which slid into the next. And that actually ended up being very valuable to us, and it ended up happening in the final design. And then for my second brainstorming idea, I, um, I kind of just was having some fun ideas with like the springs that I went with the first one. I tried having the bottom cup like adjust to the actual car's cup holder from the outside and the USB power cord was like trying to heat it up from around and it was a little strange but we were just enjoying having fun ideas and really trying to come up with the best way we could do it and so most of that didn't really get taken into the final design but my first one it kind of went into the final design. So I am definitely not the creativity or the artist in the group but um, my brainstorming was pretty horrible, if you ask me. Um, none of my ideas actually made it into the final design, so. Um, but, I mean, my idea was originally to use a dial for the heating element, but we figured out pretty quickly that that's not actually how the heating element works. So that didn't make it into the final design, although I will say my caution did make it into the final design, so that was a pretty big achievement for me. Um, other than that, none of this is really that valuable. Um, yeah. And so between our three designs that we, or, or six designs that we came up with, we decided to make a decision matrix based on the variables that each one of them had and the requirements that we were trying to fulfill. So we, um, all right, uh, we ranked each design, we asked a bunch of like, criteria and questions, which are the 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B along the top. And um, I'm not going to read them all out because honestly I don't even remember like some of them. But uh, we ranked each cup holder design based on a 1 to 5 with how well it fit each criteria. And we ended up summing up these total scores. And the Carly's first design, my first design, and my second were all some of the best when it came to actually fulfilling the criteria. So they were the most effective and we used most of their idea. And then for materials, um, at the beginning of this, like beginning of our project, we had to set up a materials list and we had to pick out materials. So most of these materials ended up being used in the final product, although some of them didn't make it. Um, so as you can see listed, Tinkercad is the software we use. 3D filament was for 3D printing the project. Um, the copper sheet went for dispersing some of the heat from the heating element. Uh, the solder wire was necessary to actually wire the heating element. The oven liners uh, didn't end up making it into the final design, right? No, they didn't end up making it into the final design. It was just going to be another way to disperse some heat. And then the USB with alligator clips was actually the wire that we used um, to wire our heating element. The Peltier is the name of the heating element. You'll see us use the words kind of interchangeably. And then construction glue and shrink wrap were like more supplies things that we needed to get the project done. And then for the cost of the product, we, um, in our original survey, did we question, did we ask? We didn't ask about it, but I think we asked some of our mentors about costs they would be willing to pay for such a product. And as well as looking at other similar products on the market that we saw earlier, and um, using that to kind of base our ideas. And the price of manufacturing was a big uh, factor, so we kind of estimated what each one would cost to make, and then threw in a little bit of money for labor, and then marked it up. It was kind of more of just like a rough estimation for our profit. You know, 211% markup from the cost to make isn't a very specific, like it's a very specific number. It's not like 200% or something, but we felt that like, the 2249 was like a good value for our product. 
So you're going to hear my voice for a while now since I'm talking about the updated designs. So this is our first design we, just, we created on Tinkercad. This was our design we created as a group. As we can see, the channels are really tiny, so are the channels inside the cup holder. But the base of the idea stays the same throughout. So the channels are slightly elevated to make all the levels the same at the end. So here it is printed, it's not that great. The printing was uh, not the best. I, I messed up with the settings, but here it is. There is different element, different holes. This one's for the peltier wires to go through. These were originally for, I think, the cooling element, but we scratched that idea because we would have caught the school on fire. But, um, yeah, so this is our first design. It has no bottom to it, it's just an adjustable top. The channels did break. So here's our redesign. We do have a spot, an indent for the Peltier to go to. On one side is hot, one side is cool. It's used mainly for computers, but we decided to use it for this. The channels are now bigger, which are flat, still elevated to different levels, so it'd be the same on top. And now we added one level to the Russian bottom. This is our design number two. Later in the presentation, you will see what the print did look like before. So we added a clip to the end of it to make sure the, the channels did not get pulled out by the user. Or up there as well. <laughs> um, it is hollow in the center, so it doesn't take that much plastic up as our original design did. And we got rid of some of the holes. Here's the different levels of the clip. The original one was just a rectangle. Then we added a clip to it. The, the hole in the middle we found off a of Thingiverse because we didn't know how to create it on uh, Tinkercad, but it did end up breaking multiple times, as Danny is showing right now, and broke off inside the cup holder. So in the end, we got rid of the hole, and we tinkered quite a bit, but we got it to work. We changed up the clips a little bit, and it fits perfectly in. I'm going to pass it off to Walker real quick. Um, so this is just some pictures of us uh, learning how to solder using a caulk gun for glue and using a heat gun to apply shrink wrap to the uh, wire. And it was just like, we had a lot of fun designing this product. Every day we would go in and we would try and come up with new ways to fix these problems. It was really a lot of fun. I think we can all agree on that. Now here's time for our prototypes, our first one. The sides are a little too small, so it doesn't hold the cup holder efficiently and does fall over. The sides also are easy to pull out, and on one side we tested the heat, the caution sign, and kind of warped the side a little bit. We had to add the oven liners to make a tighter fit, and then we also learned to solder to create the, um, the USB from the alligator. So we had to cut the wire to get rid of the alligator clips and then solder it onto the peltier wire. There is oven lining underneath the copper, underneath the copper to help disperse the heat so it doesn't melt the plastic itself. So here's the copper, here's the uh, peltier without the copper on top. It is just a, a square. It's hot on one side, cold on the other side. And then the copper's on top. But there's some holes on the other side because we messed it up and put the rectangles a little too far back, the holes. So then this is when we started to try to use proto putty, which is just, it's just silicone and cornstarch. And we kind of tried to use this so the Peltier would fit better. Um, and it was also heat resistant. So we tried to use this, but it just really didn't work out. Thanks. So this is us like making it. So it's literally just silicone in this tube over here. And then we added cornstarch. And then we just pushed it together with our hands. Um, and then over here, we were gluing the Peltier down with some construction glue, which is heat resistant up to like 400 degrees, and it doesn't get that hot anyway. So that's why we decided to use that glue. But the Proto Putty, we ended up scrapping the idea, but we thought that it was worth mentioning just because it was something new that we tried. So here's our prototype number two. Everything is. We used the same base as the first one. We printed it again because there was not really any issues with it. The only thing we did change, we create the channels in the inside a little bit deeper and then a stopper on the outside so you can't pull the sides out on the end. 
Here we can see there's a hole, which on the sides, it breaks really easily, but a lot of it doesn't come out. But if you do use a lot of force, it will break. And someone did end up cutting our wires, but we don't know who did that. So. But the sides here do hold it in place. There are, we use the same height in our, final in our final project. So here's our final design. The heat element is the same throughout all of it. We learned it once, and it worked through it all. Then we added the copper on top of it. It still has some of the holes in the back, so the uh, sides will be able to go all the way in. Uh, the bottom, there's three different pieces now, since all coupled, cup holders are kind of different. Not everyone is the same. We had struggle. We struggled, yes. <laughs> we struggled printing it because the 3D printers are 0.2 off, apparently. So we have a lot of different bottoms that don't really fit. Here's another picture of it. There's our hot sign. We printed it, and then we used a soldering iron to kind of weld it on, plastic welding, which we learned. Um, and here it is holding Danny's water bottle and without the bottoms on it. Danny's going to show you how far in and out the sides go. It does take a little bit of pressure, but this is to ensure it doesn't fall out when you're driving. There's going to be tilt test videos when we, later on in the presentation. They do not fall out because we adjusted the clips, so the clips do not break off and you can't pull them out. And so after we had our final design created, or actually I think it was a after Design 2 was created, we began testing, Design 3, we began testing our prototypes because we had to see what was working and what wasn't working. So this very first test was in our gracious principal, Matthew Campbell, it was in his car. Um, he let us go out and see how the uh, cup holder was and let us see what the, uh, how it fit in his car. And for this test specifically, it, our um, bottom layer with the Russian dolls, it was, was still a little bit loose, so we ended up revising for the final design and going back and adding an extra outer layer. That way we can ensure that it's going to fit into everybody's car. And he did have pretty big cup holders, but, um, but the, it also taught us that the, uh, the height on it was really good. Um, it sat like right in nice and neat, which was awesome, and his uh, USB was right, like it was right there, so it was definitely a good design choice to include the USB, not the cigarette lighter, or whatever you call it, the circular. All right. um, the next test was in uh, Danny Schmidlin's car. Uh, he had some oddly shaped cup holder, like the whole section is a square with circles in it, but um, overall it fit pretty well in Danny's car. Uh, once we added the, okay, once we added the extra layer at the bottom, um, I think we used that in years. If we didn't, we removed it either way. But um, it definitely fit well in Danny's car. It was a little tilty, I think, but um, I think we added some weight to the bottom and it worked, yeah. And then these three videos are our water bottle tilt tests. This was just another test we had to put in place to see, alone standing on the table, how far it could go while tilting and still remain with the water bottle in it. These proved that it, um, with different types of water bottles, it could still go to very strong angles, very sharp angles, and hold the water bottles in place, which is good news for us because that's the goal of our product. And then um, one of our final testings, yeah, one of our final tests we ran was the heat test. So we wanted to know how hot the um, Peltier, the heating element, would get the, um, get the cup holder and get a water bottle. And so this one was just the cup holder. No, this one was the water. So we, um, we measured the heat, beginning temperature of the water and we uh, set up a thermometer in the water and we would place the beaker with water into our cup holder and we let it heat up and after three minutes it had risen. I mean, the, we put hot water into the, into the beaker and over time it held the... Um, I'm way off on that. Okay, it held the temperature very well. So then this was our heat test with the cup holder. So the cup holder was preheated before the beaker was placed on, kind of like what Walker was just saying. Uh, so the beginning temperature of the water was 43.8 degrees Celsius. And then we plugged in um, the USB 
here. And the Peltier, it heats up really, really fast, so it only needed like 15 seconds to heat up. Um, so then the max heat of the cup holder um, was 112 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's like the temperature of the copper up here. Um, and then after three minutes of being on the cup holder, um, the beaker was still 43.1 degrees Celsius. So obviously, the higher the temperature goes, it's gonna cool down faster. So we felt that this was pretty successful um, after three minutes because it didn't even drop a single degree in Celsius. Um, but yeah, we felt like our, our heat worked pretty well. So we realized our cup holder was a little too light so on the first picture you can see, there is three bolts I got from Spots. I kind of just hopped with them in there to create, to create a little heavier base so it will not fall over with a heavier water bottle. Because these water bottles are metal and they do get heavy with water and ice inside um, of them. This was Walker's idea, the Russian bottom as we called it, Russian doll. And um, it actually proved to be one of like, the most effective things in our design. So, we decided to use this because cup holders can vary in size and it was really hard to get a universal size. So all of our other prototypes just had this single size for the bottom. And when you got into cars, especially like trucks, big SUVs, they have larger cup holders than like sedans, uh, stuff like that. So we decided to make this. So they kind of just all detach and it goes smaller to larger. So depending on how large your cup holder is, you can choose the larger bottom, or if you have a smaller cup holder, then you can choose a smaller, smaller one, so it fits. Um, so we felt like this was pretty valuable just because it helped us cater to anyone that has a car, not just people that have a certain size cup holder. And I think that is it. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, next group. All right, so we're good to go. All right, I'm Luke Santori. And I'm Thomas Revstock, and here is the pulverizer. All right, so if you're someone who skis, you've likely dealt with the annoyance of having to deal with ski poles, just like something to carry all day. And when you're on the lift, you're like tr sitting on it weird so you can like do stuff with your hands. And you always see them dropped under chair lifts and they make your hands cold or they're dangerous. I could go on and on. So that's basically what we targeted with our product and introducing the pulverizer, which is something that you wear over your ski clothes. And we're going to demonstrate how it works now and like its functionality. And then we're gonna take you through like our design process throughout the year. So if you wanna, like describe why. Okay, so as you can see here, it's a sash with, you can't, I can't really see right now, with some, a strap with a clip. So you conveniently just put it on. It's adjustable for every size because we wanted to accommodate everyone on this planet. And you can just easily clip it on right here as he's doing right now. And then when we spin it around, you can see that there are two straps to hold the poles with convenient buttons so that once you put the poles in like so, you can easily just clip it in. And then, Luke, please demonstrate the lift. So let's say you wanted to get on the lift and you wanted to um, look at some pictures, take some pictures, text a friend, all the fun stuff you do on the lift with your hands free. Well, Luke, what, let's say someone is on your right and this thing's in their way and they're getting mad at you because you don't know them and they're, there's two straps so we can easily just put it right here. Luke, let's say you just got off the lift and you're about to do a run and you want to take it a little slow but you don't want any poles. What do you do? Oh, how convenient is that? Take a little bathroom break. You don't want your skis stolen. You want to walk around the lodge. It's actually a little folded right now. But look at how convenient the pulverizer can be. It takes your ski pole problems out of question. Look at him, he's skiing so well with the poles strapped to his chest. All right, so 
we, the design process was split into like elements, like A through K, to just help us break it apart. So starting with element A was like finding a problem and justifying it. We, I just thought like when we were brainstorming problems, like I'm a big skier and I just thought like, well, when I'm skiing and I have poles, there's so many problems from like chairlift mobility as we describe, uh, the use of your hands, whether like you're a park rat that like likes doing tricks and wants free hands, or if you just wanna like take pictures or take care of like your kids if you're skiing with your family, or if your hands get cold and the, the kind of addresses danger indirectly because a very common injury is people will ski and have like the wrist straps on the poles, their hands through it and it'll get like stuck or they'll fall and they'll like break their wrists or like something will happen with their wrists. This will prevent that by just not having holding on, not having to hold on to it. All right, so to, that was the problem. Our justification, we did expert interviews with Donna Hill, Joseph Ritter and Gregory Gatesman and a big thank you to all of them. They really helped us with our project, especially Mrs. Hill. And they're big skiers, they're all adamant about skiing. And then we also sent out a survey just to like, gen the, like people in general. And some of the big questions that like really we felt justified it were, would you like to have the option to have your hands free while skiing? An overwhelming 83% of people said yes. How often do you see missing poles that someone lost under a lift? Only 13.7% of people said never. And more than, or about a third of people said every single time they go skiing, they see a lost ski pole. And do you ever worry about where to put your ski poles while on the chairlift to prevent them from falling? A vast majority of people said yes, in which this would help all those problems. I'm just gonna take this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> all right, so element B, we looked at prior patents, and we looked at a lot of patents, but this is the only one we really took anything from. And it was the idea of just having like the attachment at the top and an attachment at the bottom, like two points of contact, and just like the positioning over the back, like that's where we kind of got the idea started. Now there so are some existing solutions that address the problem pretty well, like these brand specific lecky poles and contractible ski poles that like mostly address the problem, but you still like have the poles like attached to your hand and like dangling around. And the adjustable ones you have to still like once they're contract, like like shortened, you still have to like put them somewhere. And they both call, or one's 160 and one's $170, and our product would only be sold at $15, so it's a massive improvement in that area. So the people that would be purchasing our product or selling our product would be outdoors and ski shops and big companies like that, like Solomon, REI, Adidas, and our requirements, before we began pro, uh, prototyping, our requirements for the consumer, we selected them and we said that they must be, it must be cheap, easy to use, be taken on and off easily, safe, strong, and be able to hold any type of pole because we don't know what type of skiers we will be dealing with. So we began with the prototyping. As you can see here, we have many bands around different body parts. We actually have something on the boot. Um, you can see one that's right across, one across the chest. And some, the two major ideas were the clip, something to just easily snap the poles into, and bands, like, um, like we have here, something to hold the pole that way. So as you can see here, we, we came up with top six solutions, and as you can see, many of them were a clip or a loop or something that went around the body, and you put this uh, pole through to hold close to your body. And then we did some reasonable rating of the things and we picked our final three. Um, the dual loop pole holder, the thigh clip, and the bungee sash. So the bungee sash was the one we actually went with. It has a similar sash and a similar strap, but as you'll see in the next slide, instead of these clips, there was bungee. What in the world? Is this on? Yes, sorry everyone, I think that was my fault. Um, and the thigh clip, many of our ideas had the clip, which seems to be the most convenient, but we don't have the materials available or the skills available to create something that would be able to sustain the wear and tear of the ski mountain and something that would consistently clip into our skis. And then the dual loop pole holder was something similar 
again, a sash, a strap, which is a recurring theme here, with, as you can see in the middle picture, many different, many different loops of stuff, but we didn't choose that because we thought it would be too complicated to get in and out with the poles. All right, so element F was just like further um, like justification for our problem in that like if a solution was produced that it would be successful in the ski market. And this is where we ordered our, um, off Amazon, all our materials that we would use for our original. This, these, this isn't our like final materials list, but this is what we started with. And it was a nylon strap and buckles for these part, for this part. And then there was a thicker nylon strap, which was just like this middle part. And then there was PVC rigid plastic sheets, which we actually wanted, like we're planning to attach to the back end because of the elastic cord that we ordered, like the bungee was gonna hold the poles originally, which would have like, just like the bungees attached to the thing would have like folded it under its own like internal tension. So we needed like the plastic background to keep it like rigid, but now we don't, we just abandoned that idea, so yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's our first product. Over to the left. You can see, I don't know if it's, I don't know if you guys can see from where you're sitting, but it's the one strap and it's the X strap at the top. And the idea was you kind of, it's kind of awkward, right? You, you would have to end up hold, holding the pole here and then kind of opening the bunsy sash and then like sliding it through. So because that, that was just too complicated, it's even complicated for, for me to do without any ski poles, we abandoned that fairly quickly. But here I am modeling. Here I am trying to be a skier, but I've never skied before when that picture was taken, so I didn't really know what I was doing. But this was like our first attempt and our first prototype just to see what it was going to be like. And then for our next prototype, <coughs> um, we decided we were going to go with Velcro. Velcro, we were going to have the same sash, the same uh, strap around the body, but instead of these button clips, we were going to have Velcro. So here we are, some action shots, creating the strap, putting the buckles on, it's a little bit of hot glue. Now, we went high end and we sewed everything. Um, here again, we're creating the sash. Here, creating a little PDF so that we can 3D print it out. Very high tech, laser cut, I'm sorry, laser cut everything so that we could cut it smoothly and then that automatically burned the edges so that it wouldn't fray. And thank you, David Lambert, because without you, this would have been an ugly project. All right. All right, so when it came to testing our prototype, I actually um, got to take it to spring break to Winter Park, Colorado for one day and test it out on the slopes. And so our first test was the snow test, basically to just test its conditions like under, like the straps were complete, the, the conditions were dry straps, snow brushed out and then really snowy. And I found a run on the mountain that started with a, a park, so I had a small jump, big jump, and then it led to moguls, and then it had a, like a wide turning part, and then I just did like a hard stop at the end. And to make each run as consistent as possible, I used like markers like a tree, and I'd try and like go down and keep my speed, not try and gain or lose any speed, so the jumps had like the same speed each time. And for the, when the straps were dry, it was perfect, it passed everything. When we simulated a fall and brushed the snow out, as most people would, it only failed on the big jump. And then when it was really snowy and snow not brushed out, which would only really happen if it was like heavy snowfall and it built up after a while, it failed on pretty much, it could only like barely stay on while turning the Velcro. So then um, our other test, the chairlift test was basically qualitative data and I was just determining if I thought it was like easy to put on and it, if it like stayed in place and I could use my hands on the lift and if I could do it while it was windy. I picked the windiest lift I could find there and there was one that went to the top that was usually closed because of how windy it is, but it wasn't, which is fortunate. And we only tested out dry and snow brushed out because of how ineffective it was with snow in it that we, I didn't want to risk just like dropping a pole and like actually losing it under the lift. And for a temperature test, it was kind of like convoluted to prove something that was common sense. Like in our poll, we just found that like the vast majority of people like agreed that holding a pole makes your hands colder versus like making a fist in your glove or something. 
So this is like kind of a cross between the last step and this one. Like we decided we needed to change the Velcro straps, but we also still needed a test to test like the strength. So we changed it for changed the straps first to the buttons, and then we tested the strength. So what we did is we pinned one part of the button to a table and then like put a string underneath and then clipped the top part on and we attached the string to a force meter and just pulled up on the string until the button like popped off and just marked the highest force as the force it could withstand. And each button on average can withstand about 12.24 newtons before coming undone. And a ski pole only weighs like 200 grams. So in order for it to come off with the two straps, it would have to like experience like 11 Gs of force, which a skier maximum can only pr like produce about eight Gs of force. So it's good there unless like you wipe out or something, but you don't want to make it too strong because then you could get injured. Like if you fall and it's like, si it's just like not in a good spot and it's like really sperm, like you want it to pop out, but it also needs to be strong enough. So we think we found a good middle ground. So here are the facts about our product because the goal was to create a product that would be sold to the skiing community for a profit. And we see here on the left, that was our first prototype and the prices of our first prototype. And on the right, you can see we, simple, we made it more simple and we got cheaper and easier materials to use. Um, and we actually had, this was further supported. Our, our final price of $15 was further supported by a survey that stated that um, just under 70% of people would be willing to pay more than $10 to ski. And then about 30% of people said, I mean about, yeah, about 30% of people said they would pay under 10. But also when we asked, do you ski with poles? About 25% of people said, that's more than 25%. 28% of people said, no, that's less. About 24% of people said, I can't see it. About 24% people said they did don't ski with poles. So reasonably we can infer that only about 6% of people would pay less than $10. So that $15 price is very reasonable. And it only cost $1.32 to produce it. So if we sold it at $15, the market price would be 1,136%, giving us a profitable product that will be mainstream soon. Are there any questions? Yes. Right here. No, we actually were wondering if we should come and bring gloves, but Luke decided against it. But he was, we were just at Luke's house and he was doing it with gloves fairly easily. Yeah, it would take like a little bit of getting used to, but like I think it, it's not too hard. And I just didn't want to do it because I, I just like thought I'd be under pressure and I'd be like messing it up up here with gloves and stuff and it'd just not be good. Yeah. Oh wait, what? It's a snap. It's a snap. Oh. It's a snap. Well, on Amazon, it's listed as like a fastening button or something. Yeah. Which one? Yeah, probably. I don't know why not. Yes. I tried the version before this with Velcro. Oh, yeah. Some people in line were like, where did you get that? And I was just like, oh, yeah, I made it in engineering class. And they're like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now it does. Next group. Hi, so I'm Aiden Pembleton, this is David Lambert, and we have another person in our group, Brian Vaichunas, unfortunately he couldn't be here tonight. But together we're Rad Inc, and this is our mobile light switch product. Okay, they want to do a problem statement? All right, so our problem statement. So our biggest, well, basically what we wanted to solve was we wanted a light switch that you could essentially place anywhere. Uh, the reason why is because moving a light switch uh, from one place on the wall to another place on the wall, it's a complicated task that requires rewiring uh, with new wire through walls, patching up old wiring, and making the new hole for the light switch in the drywall. 
and patching up the old hole. This makes it very inconvenient for individuals who feel the need to move their light switch for easier access. Individuals with disabilities requiring, adjust requiring the adjustment of the position of a light switch and the elderly that may struggle with uh, constantly needing to get up to flip a light switch to turn it on or off. We are aiming for the possibility of easily moving the switch to a more, com to a more comfortable position for an easier lifestyle. And yeah, this is just our introduction. Uh, I would first like to start by saying we fo we're focusing more on the design aspect of this presentation. Um, we just didn't really want to go in. We have all, like a bunch of surveys and all that, but um, this is more about our design. Um, and also to start, I would like to say that our product did not really function. Um, our radio transmitters and everything were just a little complicated, and especially with our shortened classes and um, hybrid schedule because of the pandemic, it was just a little bit too much time that we didn't have um, for the R&D. So um, pretty much the radio receiver and transmitter at one point did work, and when it did, it was very inconsistent. And towards the end, when we were really trying to make this thing work, um, everything together, the radio uh, receiver and transmitter did not work at all. Um, but the relay module, which kind of actually controlled the light, that worked like, per like flawlessly. That worked perfectly alone. Alrighty. So essentially, the way we split up this, we split up our project was uh, I did most of the choosing of components and assembling of the components, while Aiden did a lot of the coding. So a lot of the decision for which components to purchase and all that sort of thing went to me. So uh, how I went about this to make it most easy for me to see all the directions that I could possibly explore is I made a, a web diagram. So here's basically not many important things. This was more so just for the documentation and all that sort of thing. Stuff like um, what material would you make it out of? Uh, how would you design it? What would it look like? Uh, what audience would you garner this towards? And that's essentially what's on this. This was the bottom half of the flowchart. Meanwhile, this is the top half. This is a little bit bigger and a lot more, a lot more of the important things doesn't really matter because you can't see it anyways. So, if I take one small subsection of this out, uh, this would be the powering for the actual receiving module. So, essentially, how this, how this was designed. Well, I mean the transmitting module. So, essentially, how this was designed is you have a light switch, right? You've got basically one core component that receives light uh, signals from any light switch that you have placed. So essentially, uh, you would have one box and that is connected to the light. Meanwhile, you have switches that you could place anywhere on any wall by an adhesive, which once you flip that on, it sends a signal to that receiver and that would flip on or off the light. Now, for that, uh, transmitter, which would be the light switch that you could place anywhere without having to rewire anything. Uh, it needs power to be able to send stuff. So that is what's here. So there's a couple different ways you can power it. Obviously, you could power it by rewiring. Obviously, that's the entire purpose of our project is to not have to do that, so we weren't going with that. So one option would be power harvesting. Now, power harvesting means essentially what it sounds like, where you take uh, electricity from, you basically make electricity by harvesting other forms of power. So up there I have photovoltaics, which is normally, um, it's mostly relating to solar panels, but it can also be in related to uh, thermal things and stuff like that. So uh, taking in sunlight or change in temperature and using that to power small uh, little thing, harvest some energy, and that would be an, just enough to push out that signal that we need to send to the receiver. Didn't go with that because it's a little complicated and a little expensive, and same goes for piezoelectrics, which is essentially when you, it, it's a mechanical button, and when you press the button, it takes the mechanical force of you pushing on it, harvests that electricity, does the same thing. So we didn't go with these because they did tend to be more complicated and more expensive. And what's the point of making this product if no one's gonna buy it because it's incredibly expensive? Um, so we essentially went with a battery. Now there's 
millions of different batteries, um, and obviously we want this something available to the common consumer. So you've got a couple options. You've got double A's, you've got triple A's. They don't last very long, they're kind of annoying. Uh, and then you also have lithium batteries, uh, specific li specifically lithium cell batteries. They're a little smaller than a quarter, and they can they retain a lot of energy, and they're really useful and utilized in many uh, low power electronics, uh, and that sort of thing. So we went with the we decided to go with the cell battery. Now, for the actual transmission and receiving of that signal. That's another big complicated task in itself. So there's a couple different ways you can do it. Most of the simplest ways are what I, we have up here. So one way would be an infrared transmitter. Think of this right here, a uh, TV remote. Any of that sort of thing, it's got a little sensor that shoots an shoots a infrared signal out, the receiver takes it and does it. Now this normally needs line of sight and you may, might have furniture blocking, might be slightly around a corner. So, so we didn't want to go with this because it would severely limit where you could place the light switch. Otherwise, we have ESP32. Now, ESP32 uh, is a really cool thing. It's essentially a microcontroller board that has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and that sort of thing and is pretty low power. Um, the reason we didn't want to go with this is because we kind of wanted this to be an isolated system. So if you need to connect to uh, Bluetooth or to have it connect to Wi-Fi, you would need it to uh, then connect to some kind of server that you would have set up. Or if you went with the Bluetooth, it could be picked up by other devices. Uh, so we kind of wanted to isolate this and keep it to something where that's not an issue. And on top of that, if we progress to the point where uh, we got a working prototype, we got a working final product, we wa wanted to see if that if we could basically remove all the remove all the unnecessary components and make our own little board, solder everything onto the board rather than have a big jumbled mess of wires. Uh, didn't get there, but uh, that's another reason why we didn't go with ESP32. So that essentially leaves radio waves. Um, radio waves used in tons of common products. Uh, hobbyists love them, electronic hobbyists. So it just seemed to be the most obvious thing to go with. So we go with RFID. You can essentially shoot out a signal. It, if it's strong enough, you can even shoot it through a wall. And it just seemed to be the most obvious thing to go with. The most common one used is a 433 millihertz uh, transmitter and receiver. So that's what we went with. Now on to Aiden with the testing. So we had uh, quite a few different tests that we uh, did just to make sure that everything was gonna work properly. Um, the first of which uh, was that um, we had to change the code to make sure everything was going on okay there um, because as I said, this wasn't working too well for most of this time. Um, so I changed the code so that a smaller signal would be sent before we were sending a um, long 12-bit, um, so this long string of characters that uh, might not be picked up because it's 12 characters long. Um, I changed that to only two, and that still didn't really work. Um, that wasn't the problem. But we also made replacements in hardware, which I still think is our problem, but um, so we replaced everything from our actual microcontroller boards um, to better models of those. Um, we replaced our transmitter and receiver modules and our relay module, and still none of those really worked. But you can see here, this is a microcontroller board that I'm holding right here. Attached to that is, this is the receiver module. Attached to that, it's a relay module. We replaced all that kind of stuff, and... Just one moment, want to make sure everyone's on the same page as us, because you might not know exactly what these, mo what these different components do. Uh, Essentially, we've got the microcontroller. That's essentially the big brain of everything. We download the code to that, and basically it inputs it when it's, it's basically the thing that says, hey, I received a signal. I need to output a signal to this. Basically, that lets us uh, have the transmitter send to the receiver. So we've got two boards, one board with a transmitter, one board with a receiver. And when the transmitter sends to the receiver, it flips this thing, little thing called a relay, which essentially 
functions as a electric light switch. So instead of you pushing your finger on the light switch, a little electrical current gets flipped on and uh, allows current to go to the light and turning it on. Now that you guys are all updated with electronics and the different components that Aiden and I are talking about, get back to the presentation. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so following all of those hardware changes, we still didn't really see uh, much progress in our testing, though I'll get to it later, I still think that is our problem. Um, we also made different arrangements in wiring. We were um, trying to figure out if different voltages on the microcontroller board would fix anything. Still didn't really do much there. Um, we also replaced the wires and everything like that. Um, these are just more specifics. Uh, this is kind of how we changed our code. Um, it was just a quick process. We just had to upload new code to each microcontroller. Um, you know, if you're changing transmitter code, you have to upload it to the transmitter module um, and microcontroller board. If you uploaded it to the receiver board, you might have some problems. Um, we also opened a serial monitor on the uh, computer screen. We, had, we connected it um, via USB to the computer. Um, and that was just so we could see uh, if everything was coming through. Um, like the radio waves, we just send out a signal to the serial monitor. That was just making sure that everything was working there. Um, we waited for the init success. I wrote, in that, I wrote in that code. That just means that everything was booting up properly on the microcontroller. Um, we plugged a 9-volt battery into the transmitter. And as soon as that turned on, um, it would start sending out radio waves, um, which earlier, earlier on in our uh, development process, we were able to get some hello worlds. If you're in like computer science at all, hello world is um, a common phrase used in testing and uh, programming in general. But um, basically, if we saw hello world repeating over and over, that means we had a successful prototype. And we did see that uh, one or two times earlier on in our testing, um, which was like good. And then it all went downhill from there. But um, so all of that would signal a uh, successful test. However, later on, we didn't really see those happen. Um, so some potential thought, faults that we have, the first one being the code. Um, uh, the code might not have functioned correctly. There could have been a mistake, an error in the code somewhere, a typo. Um, you make one little typo, and the whole thing goes uh, all right. All right. But, um, so I made sure that it wasn't any of that. I reviewed the code line by line, letter by letter, to make sure everything was um, going OK. And I kind of rooted out that the code wasn't the problem, because uh, I was comparing it to tutorial documents, all this kind of stuff, um, for about three weeks, just making sure that the code was OK. And yeah, like I said, I rooted that out. Um, and like I said, it also worked before, so I don't know why it wouldn't now, because I didn't really change anything. Um, so another potential fault could be the wiring that was um, also rooted out, but yeah, we changed all the wiring and everything like that, all the wires, the individual wires to make sure uh, there wasn't any problems there. We also made sure that um, each of the data pins were okay. We tried different data pins to make sure one of them, none of them were um, you know, bad or anything like that. So we rooted out that that most likely wasn't the cause, though it still could be, I suppose. Um, and then we get to our hardware. This is what I think our problem is, just because these little cheap uh, radio transmitters and receivers aren't really the best made. Um, they're not really the best manufactured, and they are pretty cheap. So I said that this is most likely the cause for our problems, um, and the way to fix this would be just buy more expensive radio transmitters and receivers, or change to something more like ESP or something like that. Um, so after replacing each individual part at least twice over, sometimes more, um, we are still unable to replicate our previous successes, which was a little bit confusing and kind of frustrating because we were nearing the end of the year and nearing this presentation. I still didn't have anything, sadly. But you will see that this is what it will look like when we have, this, this is the serial monitor up here that I was telling you about, um, but this is what made me extremely happy after three weeks of testing. I saw this, and I was ecstatic. But um, you just see after, uh, this was every two seconds, uh, it would send out um, you know, your hello world message, and it would get picked up by the receiver and thrown up on the computer for you to see right there. 
Um, but yeah, that was successful like once, twice. Um, so this is our diagram. David can take back over um, and show you. Yep, so I went over a couple of this stuff earlier, but now you guys can actually see what I'm talking about, so I'll do it again. So here we have the transmitter module. It's really small, it's green, and it does what it says. It transmits data. Uh, then we have the Arduino Uno microcontroller. Uh, this is, like I said, what we upload the code to. It's the brain of the entire process. It interprets inputs and sends outputs. And we have the USB cable to it, which is plugged into the computer. That's how we upload and download the code. So over here, we've got the other set of uh, components. We've got the receiver, uh, rather than the transmitter, which was on the other one. Uh, it receives. We've got the Arduino Uno again, the microcontroller, and the USB testing cable. And then over here, which wasn't in the other thing, was that relay which basically you have the wire from the light that's over here going into that, and you have another set of wires coming from the microcontroller. Once the microcontroller sends a signal to the relay, it flips a little mechanical switch inside of there, and now it lets current flow through it. And that's how you turn the light on and off. Now back to basic switch testing. Um, this was just a little thing that we did earlier on, just to make sure that um, once we got to the actual physical switch part, that everything would work well on the transmitting module. And this is when our transmitting module had actually functioned prior. And all we did was just hooked up a little button um, between our transmitter module and the microcontroller. And basically when you push that button, the uh, transmitter module gets hooked up to the microcontroller and starts broadcasting its signal. And this worked very inconsistently, but um, those few times that it did work, uh, it kind of like proved to us that um, this was possible and that we could keep working towards like in this direction and just refine it later. Um, and then this is just a kind of a page for all of our um, online research and stuff that we've done. Um, basically, we look through forum posts and tutorial documents and all that kind of stuff from people using Arduinos, from people using uh, people have used these types of radio transmitters and receivers with Arduino before for other projects that we were able to pull uh, code from and things like that, which was very helpful. Um, but, yeah. So, I mean, I w in terms of our project's functionality, it, like we said, it, didn't, it did not end up working. Unfortunately, even though we had other methods, like I said, stuff like ESP32, which I would have loved to try out. Um, had we had more time without COVID, uh, that could have definitely been a possibility, but that was certainly a damper, and we would likely had to rewrite all of the code and all that sort of thing. So it, it really wasn't feasible for us to try another thing, but ha ESP32 would have been the option we went with, which has its own integrated microcontroller and uh, signaling capability, so that likely would have resolved any of the hardware issues we ran into while designing this. But yeah, just to um, kind of recap, this project was a little bit too complicated for us, especially with our limited time, um, but it was still really fun to make, and I still really enjoyed making this product. And you know, given more time, I still think this would have worked, especially if we went more to like an ESP32 direction. Um, yeah, thanks for listening to our presentation. And any questions? Come well, on, that was a lot of big fancy words. No one has anything? Yeah. So uh, during our research, uh, we did find one product that did what we, what essentially what we, well, it was a couple things. So there are switches that have uh, basically remotes that you can turn on and off and there seemed to be plenty of those on the market, but we did not really find anything where it was like an actual switch that looked like a light switch that you could just uh, basically use like command strips and just slap it on the wall and uh, essentially do what we were trying to design. That seemed to not be in existence. The only thing we found was one thing called a gecko light, and it was a Kickstarter that never took off. 
So we didn't really pull anything from that because they didn't really publish a lot of exactly how they designed it and built it. But that's the only comparable product I could find after like two days of scouring. Anything else? Alrighty, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I'll continue. I mean, it really depends uh, what I find myself doing this summer. I know I do want to get more into uh, coding and stuff with microcontrollers and that sort of thing. If I do find it, so it would be a fun project to actually do, I probably will pursue it. Uh, and I'm sure Aiden is the same because he's way more, way better at coding and way more into that than I. That's what he's going to college for. Um, yeah, just to continue, I'm kind of in the same boat as David. As long as I find time and everything like that, I would happily pursue this. Um, especially taking it in more of an ESP32 direction where I would actually, you know, it would actually work consistently. Um, <laughs> That would actually, that would kind of be a lot of fun, and I could see this being um, a real product if it would work. Does anyone else have anything? Okay. Okay, hi. My name is Sam Bethy, and this is Jack Bat, and we decided to do a water filtration project mainly because we were inspired by something that we did uh, in, in second year in this class with Ms. Burson when we did a much smaller scale and we only did this for about two weeks. Ours wasn't successful, so we wanted to try it again. So our problem in justifying our problem. Water filtration and the need for that around the world is one of the biggest challenges that us as engineers, that us as engineers in just the world face today, it's widely regarded as one of the big nine engineering problems, which essentially means that it's in much critical state, and if it is ever solved, it would save millions and millions of lives, which is what we strive for as engineers. So just up, just up there, are just some examples of kids in Africa specifically, which is the market, market that we were targeting. We were targeting villages in Africa that were unable to filter water or just drank water from unfiltered sources. So these are just some facts that really stood out to us when we started our research. 785 million people lack access to safe drinking water. 435 million take water from unprotected wells and springs. 144 million take water from untreated surface water, like lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams. Unsafe drinking water can cause countless health effects and diseases. And when we first started this project, we realized that we wouldn't be able to solve this problem, as there are millions of people around the world trying to solve it, because if they did, they would save millions and millions of lives and save one of the biggest problems that our world faces today. But we wanted to essentially look at just a small part of it to maybe solve a small uh, or a massive problem that people, that maybe one village in Africa or one family um, so that they could have clean drinking water. Okay, so we then conducted a survey as suggested by Ms. Hill and some of our other mentors. And our survey was essentially basic because we already knew that this was a problem that was justified. But we surveyed educated people in a group around the world that Ms. Hill is a part of. We got, I believe, 150 responses from teachers and engineers around the world who know about this problem a lot more than we did when we first started. So the first question was, are you concerned about the lack of safe drinking water in the world? And a majority of people were concerned. Half of them were very concerned about it. The 
next question was, do you think that an inability to collect clean drinking water is preventing people from working themselves out of poverty? And three, over three quarters of people said yes, but 20% didn't know, I guess because there's just not enough like public knowledge of this problem. So that's another issue that we wanted to address. It's like bring light to this problem. The next question is, do you think that consuming contaminated water contributes to health issues in poverty stricken areas? And everybody said yes, except for one person. I don't know why. And then the next one, do you think that the common methods of collecting water in third world countries, such as carrying water from a lake to their house or using a well, are too demanding on families? The majority of people said yes. Okay, so now for our existing solutions. We did a lot of different research about existing patent, patents that were, have both expired and are currently going just to see exactly what other people have come up with because like I said, this is a problem that's going, or that's many people around the world are trying to solve. So the first one is essentially um, a cone-shaped device with just the different filtri filtration layers throughout and you just pour the water through and then it comes out filtered, which is also essentially used in a lot of common households today with filters like Brita. And then the next one is more like the life straw, which is one of the most common ways to filter water, especially in villages in Africa, as they have many different programs that distribute these devices throughout Africa and other areas. It's essentially tiny little strings that run vertically that don't interfere with the flow of water, but when the water gets pushed through uh, the filter, the water will go through these tiny membranes within the strings, taking out the viruses, bacteria, dirt, leaves, whatever's in there. And then we have the life straw, which is essentially the same thing as the second patent. And then the next one, it was the first prototype of what's called um, the life bottle which is essentially a life straw within a water bottle. So it's way more portable and you don't have um, a vertical tube just uh, in your pocket at all times. And there are many different other patents that we've researched, but these are just four of them. So we got some expert advice. The first expert was Mrs. Villagol. She is a chemistry and environmental pro professor at Penn State. Some of the advice she gave us was to fo focus on the social impact. Like one of the current solutions that was out that we saw was where they had kids play on the playground and it created clean water. But like after a few years, the kids just get tired of doing that every day. So we didn't want to like ruin the culture or the social impact. And the next one was to create a way for the product to be sustainable after the engineers leave so that the people living in the village are able to repair the product if it gets damaged without having to call the engineers over. And then the third piece of advice was to use Moringa oleifera seeds to remove viruses. We have a slide discussing that, so we'll explain that later. And then the second expert was Mr. Hill, an industrial engineer at American Water. His first piece of advice was to focus on the different aspects of filtration such as disinfection, filtration, the chemical removal, and different layers of the filter to remove like big, pro big contaminants down to smaller contaminants. So before we even designed a product, we wanted to come up with some design requirements, and these were essentially to ensure that the product or the final product that we made would be successful in the end and that people in villages within Africa would be able to filter water for a, a longer amount of time compared to um, previously and previous projects that engineers um, have developed. 
for these people. Like Jack said, that merry-go-round, the kids would play on it, and then eventually the parents would have to play on it to actually even get clean water to sustain their families and other villages around them. So the design requirements that we came up with, these are just four of the major ones. We had many more. But one of them was the efficiency of removing harmful contaminants as we wanted it, we wanted the water to be filtered in a timely manner as many of the other products such as the Life Straw or what's called the Life, uh, the Life Family or the Life Community. Those filter water in a very timely manner and so our product wouldn't be able to compete with the existing market if it wasn't able to filter water effectively. The next one is cost effective in local materials. The target audience has very little money and they live under a dollar a day. So we need to scrounge up materials that are readily available to them to be able to actually make this product work and feasible for them, especially long term. The next part was easily repairable. This came from our project in sophomore year as we just did one singular module, uh, which was a two liter soda bottle. And when one thing went wrong or one thing needed to be cleaned, we were not able to easily do that and we would have to dump out everything and restart. And then the next one what came from Ms. Viogel with having no societal impact in our prime example was the merry-go-round and the parents having to play on it to even get drinkable water. So these are a couple of our ideas that we had when we were brainstorming. So the first one is a water bottle with a built-in filter so you can pour dirty water into it and then when you drink it, it comes out clean. The next one is like a life straw, but instead of using a membrane, they use different materials. The one on the right on the top is another water bottle with a filter built in. And then the, the bottom right is a gravity filter where you can push down on it to push the water through a membrane. And we initially came up with a total of 50 different ideas and 50 different sketch sketches to be able to solve this problem. We narrowed it down to six and then narrowed it down again from there. This is that process of narrowing down the ideas from six to one after we narrowed down it from 50 to six. So we just had a bunch of different categories that we rated each one by, such as how easy it is to build, to use, to repair, the cost of it, the efficiency, if it actually it cleans water, the materials, if they're local materials, the filtration, if it's a good filtration rate, and then the amount of water that can be filtered. And this was our final design. We essentially came up with something that had separate modules so that it was much easier to actually clean out a certain part so, we, so the people wouldn't have to take and take out the other parts and then waste all those resources as they do live under a dollar a day. And we initially had it much larger um, than our final product, but once we started building and prototyping, we realized that the, I believe it was 11 feet that we originally had it at, that the 11 foot total module wasn't feasible um, and that it wouldn't ever work, especially because they don't have uh, the materials as readily as we did here because we ordered most of them. So this is our first prototype. So you see on the bottom left, there's two pictures of cups. The left one is Moringa sand, and then the right one is normal sand, or Moringa seeds, not sand. And then we got our numbers, like how much to weigh them for how much water. We got that from a research paper from Mrs. Villical and her 
um, her students sent us their final thesis paper. And then the other three pictures are us crushing the moringa and then grinding it in the grinder at the bottom picture. And then the top right, you can see the white water. That's when we added the moringa to water. It creates a white water. And then you add that to sand. And then you add the moringa sand, which we'll explain in another slide. These are just more pictures of us in our design phase. Um, the picture on the right is important because that there's aluminum foil on the top. We originally wanted to have some kind of support, so we tried aluminum foil in between each layer, so there was more support between each one. And then the other two are just running dirty water and cleaning out the charcoal, because when we ran water through this the charcoal layer, which is on the bottom, it comes out with a, like a black tint, so we had to run multiple tests through that just to get the black color out of it so it comes out clear. And this is just, again, a small amount of the progression of our final product as we did work on this the entire year. And then these different pictures, these are essentially the ending of the product in some of our different tests. So the one all the way on the left is again what Jack was talking about, how we had to run a lot of water through the final layer, which was the charcoal, to be able to make the water come out clear. And then the other tests were uh, different amounts of sand and testing how that affected the flow rate and the overall um, final color of the water that went through the filter. And then the moringa sand and how that affected the different contaminants as that would essentially take out the bacteria and the viruses that would be found in surface water. And then this is our last slide of pictures and essentially shows the final product once again. On the left, you can see the water that we first tested and the dark color of it, it's a dark brown. The water in the middle, although it is such a small amount, it is the water that we have filtered. And then the water on the right is clear water that we um, collected. So there is a massive difference as the water in the middle is completely clear, just as it is on the right. And then the picture in the middle is one of our uh, prototypes and developments in the prototypes and you can see the aluminum foil which we use to as Jack said keep the layers um, above one another so that the caps and the coffee filters weren't embedded in the next layer and then the final materials so we used water bottles river rocks two modules of regular sand Moringa sand and activated charcoal plus uh, coffee filters. And the little arrows that we have up there are the materials that we'd be switched out actually in the field for when the people in Africa are making these modules for themselves. So plastic water bottles, they do cost a decent amount and it is much easier, we found out through research, to make ceramics um, using mud, which is readily available, and then they would just have to start a fire. And we would give them different uh, molds so that they would be able to make these ceramics much in a much easier and much faster way than just making them from scratch. And then the coffee filters, they of course don't have coffee filters readily available, so they have mesh available that they may use for clothes in some aspects, and they would be able to reuse that um, in place of the coffee filters in the final design. So this is the slide about Moringa Oleifera. So the Moringa Oleifera, when you crush it up, the inside of it has the opposite charge of viruses, such as E. coli, which is the virus that they tested the most. 
So it cling, the E. coli clings to the moringa seeds, and then it becomes like a bigger, a bigger piece, so it's easier to actually take it out of the water when it runs through the filter. So to create the moringa water, the moringa sand, first we had to grind down all the seeds, which we showed before. We used a mortar and pestle and a grinder. And then we add it to water and stir it until we create that white water. And then we add that water to sand so the moringa can stick to the sand. And then we filter out the water and let it dry. And then the remaining sand is capable to remove E. coli. So some of the different tests that we did were visual, smell, taste. Those were the three main ones. And then we also tested different amounts of sand for the flow rates and the clarity of the water. Different amounts of charcoal, because the charcoal at first, the water wouldn't really go through it. So we had to do multiple tests for that. And then the structure with the aluminum foil and then double coffee filter. So we added coffee filters in between each layer to hold the materials up, like the sand and the charcoal. And then we added two coffee filters just to clean the water even more. Okay, so our final test. The big three tests that we identified that are most important are the visual test, which is just seeing if the water turned from brown to clear, the taste test, uh, obviously, we didn't taste the water when it was brown and there was dirt and rust in it, but we wanted to taste if it um, had any like extremities in, or tasted metallic in any way, as that would indicate that our filter failed. And then the smell test, because the water that we did collect had a little bit of a metallic smell, and once again, after it was filtered, if the metallic smell was gone, then that would indicate that it would be uh, much more clear and safer to drink than it previously was. And the pictures that we have up there, the one on the left is our final test. The middle water is the water that we have filtered. The water on the right is the water that we collected from the sink in our room. And then the water on the left is completely clear water. And then on the right, you can see me actually tasting the water. This was one of the final tests that we ran where the water initially looked like the water on the right and I drank whatever came out of the filter um, as our final test. And this is another progression of our final test. The water on the left, all the way to the left, isn't as dark but we, it was still a good indicator as there was, um, again, dirt and rust within the water. And then the water on the right, once again, is what we filtered. And as you can see in all three of these final tests, the water in the middle was clear. There was no smell to it whatsoever. So we did know that it was more safe to drink that way. The visual test, of course, um, passed as all three of the containers were full of clear water. In the taste test, I thought the water tasted fine. I initially compared it to smart water when I first tasted it. Um, thank you. And that is the, yeah. And then just looking at the final modules, each of them you can remove, and they fit snugly into one another. So it's easily assemblable, assemble. So you just initially pour the water into the river rocks, and then the river rocks, that water, essentially, or the river rocks essentially take out big piles of dirt, leaves, anything else massive. And then it goes through the first layer of sand, and that sand um, takes some of the color out and filters a lot of the smaller contaminants. The next layer of sand does the same thing, if any contaminants initially did, 
get through the first layer of sand, they would be caught in the second layer of sand. And then it would go through to the Moringa sand where viruses and bacteria would be taken out. And then finally, the last layer is the charcoal layer, and that is the chemical filtration that Mr. Hill was initially talking about, as that improves a lot of the taste, that improves um, how it looks and the smell. And then, uh, just to speak on a little bit how this all would work. So the river rocks would easily be found um, in Africa. Same with the sand and the Moringa sand. There's Moringa trees readily available throughout the continent of Africa so that they would be able to collect these seeds year round and then be able to crush up the seeds and make the Moringa sand themselves. The coffee filter, as we said before, would be replaced by mesh, which is also readily available as they do make their own clothes. And then the water bottles would be replaced with ceramics, which again, they would make themselves, which would be much easier for them and wouldn't take up any of their um, costs or their dollar a day. And then the activated charcoal, what we plan to do or what our initial uh, plan for the overall project was to go into a village in Africa where they really needed uh, clean drinking water. And our engineers would explain how the device works, what everything is, how to make the entire device, drop off different drop off like molds so that they would easily be able to make the ceramics and they would explain what each different part does and how that and how they can make the different modules and then the activated charcoal we did some research and life straw how they uh, distribute their products throughout villages in Africa there's a little bit of a loophole where if they donate their products to these people in Africa, there's actually a tax on carbon emissions where they can make a profit on all of their products that they give away so that, um, or that would, we would essentially do the same thing and that would cost, cover the cost of all of the activated um, charcoal that they would ever need as our activated charcoal, we would use a lot smaller amount and it would cost a lot less than the life straw itself. Yeah, questions? Yeah, so there was a specific number in the thesis that we received from uh, Dr. Viogel. Um, and we would, of course, test this more thoroughly as we are only high school students and cannot completely test everything about this device. I believe that it was like 25 gallons around there, 25 to 40 gallons of water that it would actually be able to filter before it would be rendered useless and you would have to make another batch. Um, well, we didn't specifically put in a certain amount and see how much came out as of course there is water that would be um, absorbed by the sand specifically we found that out and even a little bit um, from the charcoal but for a large majority of the tests there was a good output for the amount of water that actually came out um, we did filter a large amount 
of water at one point. I believe it was 200, no, 500 milliliters. And we didn't specifically see how much water came out. But I would, I would think it'd be 400 milliliters about, or 350. Uh, so initially it took a long time. Uh, it took a whole period to filter just a small amount of water. Um, but as we kept testing and kept developing um, different models and different modules, it did get a lot faster. And we never specifically timed um, the device as a whole. But over a minute, it did filter um, a decent amount of water for how much we put in. Um, well, I think I just volunteered. Walker also tested it first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we didn't actually test for anything like that, but the research paper did support the E. coli that can be removed because of the Moringa. But if we were to commercialize it, we would obviously test for all the major contaminants just to make sure that it's safe. Do you have any more questions? All right, so um, we had the idea of creating an extremely calorie-dense energy bar. As you can see, we, we don't really have a name, but we are planning on uh, making this into an eventual product one day, so that's going to be something we'll resolve eventually. But um, yeah. um, So I'm going to start explaining the problem statement. So uh, similar to other groups, our research uh, and development was split into elements A through K. Um, um, so our main idea that we had originally was just a meal replacement energy bar for uh, athletes that would do endurance events such as uh, marathons, Ironmans, triathlons. Uh, so it would sort of uh, serve as a meal replacement. So that was our original uh, design idea. Uh, and then as we collected more information and did more research, we kind of broadened our uh, original problem statement and we expanded and then condensed it into one statement, which you see on screen here. Um, and one of the, most of the things that we took into account is convenience and also the actual effect on the body, uh, which I'm going to explain in the next slide as well. Uh, so most of the reasons uh, were maintaining cal uh, caloric maintenance, which is basically if you exert a lot of calories, then you're going to need to consume more calories to kind of maintain that level. Um, and what a lot of athletes struggle with, with uh, specifically endurance sports, is under eating and not getting enough nutrients. And there are kind of two sides of the spectrum of, you can eat a meal, you can eat like a full meal, but it's very inconvenient because there's prep time, there's cooking, and there's actually eating it, which doesn't really fit into the lifestyle of um, like a, an athlete that performs intense uh, events. And then you have other energy bars that either don't really have enough calories to like actually be utilized. Um, and then there are some that have a lot of calories, but they aren't really, they're lacking in other micronutrients that are very important for health. Uh, so we kind of wanted to reach like an equal point where we have a lot of calories and a lot of nutrients and also convenience so you can eat it whenever. Um, and another and very important aspect is the, kind of the industry or market that we aimed at is that because it is, very calorically dense. It not only fits into energy bars, but also uh, fitness nutrition, because 
Um, it's not only, I guess, energy, it's also like a meal replacement. So it would fit into both and it would broaden our demographic, um, leading to potential wider success, I would say. Um, so I'm gonna go into a little bit more um, of a description because one of the shocking things that we found is that um, a lot of female college swimmers will intentionally undereat, um, and this is a byproduct of kind of the inconvenience of eating a full meal, and because they exert thousands of calories a day, that is an extremely tall order to meet, and in a lot of times it is, they do not reach that amount, and they will be underfed, which can lead to a lot of health um, disadvantages and yeah. All right, so part of our initial ingredient brainstorming was uh, uh, strategizing how we would uh, break down the bar in terms of the macronutrients. Uh, one thing we knew was that fats were probably what we should uh, emphasize most in the bar since the calorie to gram ratio in bars is nine, whereas opposed to proteins and carbohydrates, this figure is only four. So if we could pack in more like nutty flavors such as almonds or in cashews um, and just increase that lipid content, it would be uh, very likely that we would get to our uh, calorie goals of 700, 800 while also uh, being low volume and uh, convenient to eat. As you can see, fats, for every gram of fat, it's nine calories. Protein and carbs, it's only four. All right, so in terms of our uh, market analysis, Jeff uh, briefly touched on this uh, originally, but we're potentially straddling between uh, three markets. The first being the sports nutrition industry as we're accommodating to a wide variety of athletes. This industry is projected the reach an evaluation of about $81 billion by 2023. The energy bar industry is a pretty significant industry worth over $5 billion. Our bar is completely unprecedented in the fact that it's so high calorie and also the health food industry, uh, which is a really huge market. So uh, for our first prototypes, this was uh, probably the most exciting part of the project. We were first uh, putting ingredients together. We had some of uh, the nuts in there, but uh, our process initially was to just put all our ingredients in a blender and then uh, pack it into a container, as you can see there, and refrigerate it so that uh, it, the hope would that it would then be compact enough to be eaten like as a bar. But as you can see, we, we struggled with that at first. It, it didn't have adequate rigidity and it, it would just kind of fall apart. Um, so we, we weren't really looking for this to be something that you would eat with a spoon, but uh, that th this was a major problem that we would uh, solve through mentor meetings and uh, eventual changes down the line. As I, as I touched up on, it was loose and grainy structure, uh, pretty undesirable texture and uh, it, this was due to our uh, fat source, which we, which we clarified with Ms. Moles in our mentor meeting because the problem was that we were using a, a liquid at, a, a fat source which was a liquid at room temperature. And uh, no matter what we would do, it, it would just be, fall, it would just fall apart once we uh, went to eat it. So. What Ms. Moll suggested to us was that we use a, a type of clarified butter, which is solid at room temperature, and this drastically changed the overall um, uh, consistency in addition to using an egg white, which would hold all the ingredients together. But with an egg white, since it is a raw ingredient, we also did have to bake it. So um, it, uh, the results were pretty, uh, pretty uh, satisfactory. It was after we made those changes, it was very bar-like, but um, the problem then was taste. Um, it was pretty bland for, because we, we had so, so many uh, uh, nutty like uh, flavor profiles as well as the egg white. It just wasn't really that uh, appealing to eat and we, we discovered that also through our testing stages when we sampled it to people. Um, so we, we decided to kind of make some changes to the ingredients, 
more, take, take less of certain stuff, and increase the sweetness by adding more dates. Also, a big part of this project was um, uh, having a clear idea of the amount of calories and its, its per precise weight so that we could have a good calorie to gram analysis and as well as macronutrient breakdown. So I created a, a spreadsheet, as you can see there, I have a screenshot, but we would have the ingredients listed here, the amount in e of each one, and then immediately would input the weight, the cost, production cost, uh, as well as the calories and macronutrient breakdown. I wish this was bigger so you guys could see, but this was a really helpful tool as we were prototyping. And um, also another big part of our uh, prototyping stages was different ch changes we made. Uh, whereas initially in the beginning, we would put all our ingredients in a blender and uh, just kind of have it all, all as one mixture. It, w it was kind of tough to uh, make a, a s standard, consistent product every single time because uh, the dates and the, and the butter would just kind of mess everything up and it was kind of tough to blend. So. I, um, I had the, we had the idea to measure things by um, volume, which would decrease the time to make each bar as opposed to weighing it out on an electric scale. And um, also chopping up the dates before blending it helped, as well as melting the ghee butter uh, before putting it into, before combining it with the other ingredients. And then this is our final product here. Um, we, we ended up making a lot of changes after um, reaching nine prototypes, but uh, one thing that really helped was adding more peanut butter because it, it really helped hold all the ingredients together. And um, uh, w we realized that we actually didn't need the egg white anymore because when, once we basically doubled the amount of peanut butter, all, it, it, was, it was rigid enough to the point where we didn't really need to bake it. So. This is basically, uh, I would consider this just a, a peanut butter bar. We just, um, we uh, put all the dry ingredients, blend it into like a powder, melt the ghee butter, um, mix it with the whey protein concentrate, and then mix that mixture with the, with the dry ingredients, um, incorporate the peanut butter, put it in the fridge, and then it comes out rigid enough to be a bar. Basically, he just explained that uh, we prototyped and our focus kind of evolved to make it a higher ratio of uh, calories to grams. That's the whole idea. It initially contained way too much volume. And it would be kind of pointless to have a 900 calorie bar that's four times as big as, say, a cliff bar. So we wanted to make it uh, really calorie dense, and that's sort of how our focus evolved. Uh, naturally, the bar just improved uh, throughout making nine prototypes. So we got some samples. This bar here, uh, just to give you guys a reference, it's this big, four inches by two inches, holds 813 calories, and it's only 161 grams. And we're gonna give out samples because we know it's been a long evening and many of you may be hungry. Tastes delicious, but yeah, I don't know. Who wants to try some? Yeah. Plates, knives, any questions? Yes, Ms. Bowling. Yeah, that, that's a great point. We, we thought about that in previous elements as well, because um, if, if we could just donate this and uh, it would be a great uh, charity cause as well to Im impoverished countries where many struggle with food insecurity, starvation, so that, that's a great idea as well. And if we ever get to the point where we have a successful, profitable company out of this, that, that would definitely be something we could do to get our name out there and just improve our image. Yes, Mr. Fields?
Yeah, un unfortunately that is an issue, not, not allergies, but um, the, the, we, our, our number one ingredient is peanut butter, so that is kind of tough to manage, but it, we, we may consider making different flavors in the future. Um, we, we do want to eventually make a company out of this, so we could, we could um, have new flavors, uh, decrease production costs, and see what, see what we can work around with that so more people would get to enjoy this bar. Yeah. Any other questions? Who wants to try it? Let's go. No, this is the exact this is the exact same one. Just to be clear, the what what's in this is um, peanut butter, dates, cashews, chia seeds, Cascadian Farms coconut cashew cereal, ghee butter, and whey protein concentrate. All right, I, I don't know how we're gonna do this, but anyone can try some if they want. Try this. Have you have you taste? It's great. It's good. There's no ad there's actually no added sugars in this. No added sugars, which is really extraordinary. Your thoughts, Danny? Danny says it's very good. It's good? Okay, all right, Walker. Sam wants a piece. But yeah, we, this is, a lot of people said they like the taste, but some, some may think that the peanut butter is a little overpowering, but. What? That'd be a good idea. Yeah, definitely increasing variety. Exactly. All right. Well, again, thank you to all of our uh, presenters tonight. Um, again, I'm just I'm amazed by the, the hard work that you guys put into it, the thoughtfulness, and the variety of different topics that you guys have come up with over the course of, uh, over the, course of the year. Um, as a memento for all of your hard work over the last four years, um, tomorrow when you pick up your graduation gowns, I also will have a, there'll be a specific cord that'll be only for the Project Lead the Way students. Uh, so you'll wear that at graduation and it will also be recognized in the graduation program at the ceremony on, on Friday. So uh, again, tremendous job. Um, I want to thank you for, for all of your hard work and for the presentations tonight. And if you guys wouldn't mind if you take your projects maybe out into the atrium and we'll just set them up and if anybody wants to come up and take a look at them and ask some questions one-on-one. -on -one, and if we want to take the, uh, the, pro the protein bars out there, you could try another snack if we can a little bit cut those up into some more pieces. Um, if you would just to help me with uh, one more round of applause for all of our students. And <laughs> all right, thank you. We'll uh, just get set up out in the atrium and we'll go out there and uh, mingle for a little bit. Thank you.